So, Mr. Guthrie Govan, welcome to Linear Rock. Thank you. And um, video interview. So we would like to know you a little bit better and know about your career, your story, and your future projects. So I have a few questions for you. Cool. Um, you are here in Italy for some guitar clinics. It's true. Is that correct? Okay. Um, how do you uh, lead these kind of events? Uh, do you have your own pattern or do you actually accept um, questions from uh, fans, from the people that come oh, to the... totally. I found there's no point in having a detailed plan. Mm-hmm. Because every crowd of people is different, every yeah. group of guitar players has its own yeah. set of concerns. Yeah. Uh, so generally I'll turn up at a clinic, I'll play a song, tell them my life story in two minutes and then say, right, what do you guys want to know about? Uh -huh. You tell me what to talk about and that, that way I know at least one person is interested in what I'm saying. Uh -huh. It's strange for me to do clinics because I'm completely self-taught. But, uh -huh. I have, wow. but I've taught a lot of other people how to play guitar over yeah. the years, so I guess what I try to do is teach people how to be self-taught. Okay, that's bizarre, that's yeah. good. I but mean, uh, um, that's very strange actually, you are completely self-taught, you never, never took a lesson, well, guitar my, lesson. My father showed me about five chords wow. when I was very young, yeah. when I was three, and then he said, that's it, that's all I know, but there's my record collection. Okay. So I used to slow down lots of Hendrix and Clapton and Beatles and... So from that on you, you did it on your own? Yeah. Just listening to music? Yeah. I mean later on I started reading books. I would go to the library and find All books right. about music theory but it always started with the sound. Yeah. And then I would find the words to describe the sounds. And uh, what kind of people usually come to your guitar clinics? It's young, old, all musicians or Men. maybe... Men. men, just come men. To my clinics, <laughs> mostly. Um, yeah, I, I get a, a lot of the sort of the younger shredder guys with the, the Ibanez guitar and the ponytail and the notebook. Sometimes I'll get some of the older blues guys, but yeah, yeah, I guess a lot of them are pretty young. And what's the most weird question that you you got on a guitar clinic? Um, I think the, the weirdest ones were at a school in Pasadena uh -huh. when they would say things like, do, do you recommend the use of recreational drugs to become more creative? Oh. Like, I'm in a guitar school, what do you think <laughs> I'm going to say? Your teacher who hired me is sitting at the back of the room. Don't be silly. <laughs> All right. And at the same clinic someone else said, how is it possible to practice a lot and also have a girlfriend? It's like, that's not the kind of question I was hoping for. Uh -huh. you know, I was hoping yeah. more for how do I play over a dominant seventh chord? Or, <laughs> Something like that. But it's all good. It's nice to be surprised at clinics. What do you think that makes your clinics special? A lot of guitarists, you know, used to do uh, these kind of things, but what is special on a Guthrie Govan clinic? Um, well, I guess every clinic is special because it's mm -hmm. a certain personality and a certain musician yeah. as an individual, as a character, yes. who's giving the clinic. So what you get is and an insight into how that player thinks. So I guess that's what's special about my clinics, but that doesn't mean I'm awesome. That's what's special about everyone else's clinics as well. Um, it's an individual thing, <clears throat> and rather than a normal guitar lesson in a school, where okay. it, you would say, right, today we're going to learn these three scale shapes. Go home and learn those scale shapes. This is more about people who would come to see the player because they like the player, and they have questions that are specific to like the way, say, I play, if that makes sense. Yes, of course. <laughs> Do you use uh, any pre-recorded tracks during the clinics, just your own music or also music from uh, other artists? Um, I, I have backing tracks for some of the music on my album, mm -hmm. so I'll play along with that if people want me to. Yeah. To be honest, I don't enjoy it that much. I much prefer to play my music with a real band. Okay. Because to me it's like jazz but a lot louder and it's nice to be able to interact yes. with the other people. And of course, this is my backing band for most <laughs> Linux and it doesn't listen to me. All right. It just plays the song and I have to do the same thing every night and it's not fun. Right. It's not very rock and roll. But people like it so I do a little bit. I also have a pedal on the floor mm -hmm. which um, I can use to loop 
All right. a section playing yeah. so I can just write a song then, at the clinic, record wow. it and then play over the top of it. So that's that's nice. It's a bit like playing someone playing with someone else. Did it ever happen that you wrote a song during a clinic? Actually something that you, then you oh, right. develop uh, after or a Oh, I, I never revisit them. As soon as the clinic's over, I've forgotten. But, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I normally write something at every clinic. It's not very good. No. But it's always something slightly new. Um, so you said that you started playing at three, uh, three years old. Was that um, your own decision, your own choice, or was your father actually that said, you, you must check out the guitar, it could be cool, or how did it happen? I don't remember exactly. <laughs> yeah, you were uh, pretty young, three years old, you know. I remember learning my first chord, but I don't remember much about life before that. Uh -huh. So I don't know if I said, I want to play guitar, or if my dad said, I think it would be funny to take a photo of our small child trying to play guitar. It, it could have happened anyway. Yeah. But certainly I grew up in a house where there was always a guitar in the corner of the room. Yeah. We were always exposed to music not just as a background thing, we, everyone in my family grew up appreciating that music is a serious thing yeah. and that you should listen to it. It's not just wallpaper right. that should go on quietly in the background whilst you lead your life. You can sit there and appreciate music as a work of art. So we all grew up thinking that. And I guess any kid in that situation would put two and two together and say, OK, music is a serious thing and I feel good when I listen to music there's a tool over there that you can use to make music. I want to make music. Yeah. So that, I mean, as every child, that was your dream to make a living out of music or it simply happened? No, it was more like, like why does anyone choose to learn a language? Like in, in your case, perhaps, why did you decide to learn Italian? You didn't. Yeah. All you know is now you speak Italian and it's really helpful and it's part of the way you think. And music for me was like that. It's just, I, I grew up surrounded by music and I learned the language of music the same way I learned the language of English. Uh, it was never a conscious decision, yeah. All right. really. Very natural thing. And in terms of trying to make a living out of it, <laughs> I don't know. I'm still trying to work out how to make a living out of it. Um, uh, how long do you practice every day? I don't really. You don't? No. That's amazing. I mean, you're very good. <laughs> well, I try. <laughs> I, I've played a lot over the years, but I think there's maybe a difference between playing and practicing. And to me, practice is an ugly word. All right. Practice means locking yourself in a room and doing an exercise over and over again. Yes. And I never had the attention span for that. All I ever wanted to do was play the sounds that I heard in my head yeah. or copy the sounds I heard on a record and try and make everything sound good. So for me, it's always been fun. There's never, I've never needed that discipline element because I've always just wanted to play. And that's because uh, you're self-taught, maybe because of that. I mean, it's something that uh, it's just a feeling. You let it go and uh, you play. Uh, possibly. I mean, mm. I think a lot of the the stuff that needs improvement in what I do is stuff I can improve without touching a guitar. Mm. Uh, my fingers pretty much know where to go to make the sounds that I would need to make. Yeah. Um, it's all about the music up here. If I'm trying to copy the sounds that I hear in my head, then the way to get better is to make the music in my head more interesting. Mm. So a lot of that happens just by thinking about music, which I can do when I'm sitting on a train, or trying to feed myself new music. I'm always mm. looking for new things to listen to, you know, new things to inspire me. And that's, that's as close to practice as I get. It's, it's all up there. Yeah. How many guitars do you own? at the moment? Um, let me think. I probably have about 15 stringed instruments, but one of them is a banjo. Okay. Um, a couple of them are cheap acoustic guitars. Mm -hmm. Three of them are basses. Okay. So, I don't know, I have a few guitars, but <laughs> I know doctors and lawyers who can hardly play who have more guitars than me. <laughs> So I don't feel bad about it, <laughs> right. and I can justify every <laughs> instrument I own. It's there for a, a very special reason. All right, good. Uh, do you have any favorite one, the favorite guitar, the one that you pick, you know, naturally, maybe? Um, there's a favorite guitar that I would take to any gig, mm -hmm. 
which is lurking in that bag behind All you. Right. Um, I have to like it because it's made by a company called Sir. Sir. We, we have a kind of relationship, mm -hmm. and it's my signature model, which means I help to design the spec of the All guitar. Right. So I have to like it because it's exactly what I asked for. And on a more emotional level, I also really like my old Gibson SG yeah. because it was the first good guitar I ever had. So it's like the part of my history. But I would never take it on tour. Mm. in case it got damaged or stolen oh, and right. I'd just be destroyed. <laughs> because it's a matter of heart. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's like a family photo album. Oh, okay. You know, it's yeah, different from thing. the workhorse guitar that does everything yeah. and it's reliable. And, and concerning your signature model, model that you just mentioned, um, what do you actually need from a guitar? How did you design it and uh, what was your request for the instrument, the special request? Well, a lot of the problems a guitarist would face when looking for the perfect guitar, a lot of those problems have disappeared already as soon as you go to the Surf Factory because everything they do is very consistent. Mm -hmm. and they're very well made, they're very playable, it's very resonant. And those guys really know about how the, the different woods you use will affect the tone of the guitar. And that's not just about finding the best piece of wood for the body and the best piece of wood for the neck. Yeah. It's, it's like a good marriage of different woods and they're good at combining things uh, to make something that's greater than the sum of the parts. So through working with those guys for years I've learned a lot of their wood voodoo and I have some idea what different woods will sound like and I discovered that mahogany mm -hmm. is the tree that sounds yeah. the closest to the guitar I imagine in my head. So oh, generally I'll go for a mahogany guitar and then use different pickups and different wiring to get the other sounds. But I guess really it starts as the sound of a Gibson SG or something like Angus Young mm -hmm. or Frank Zappa mm -hmm. in the 70s. And that's what I think a guitar should sound like. And then all the wiring and the tricks we can use to make it sound like a Fender Strat or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you use a different gear? live and in the studio or it's pretty much the same one? Um, pretty much the same. I mean, the, my live gear varies slightly depending on the gig. Mm -hmm. um, but last year I, I did a lot of gigs with a rapper called Dizzy Rascal uh -huh. and no one over here has heard of him but in England he's huge. Everything he releases goes to the top of the pop charts and stays there. So it was a pretty high pressure gig. Yeah. Uh, you can't afford for anything to go wrong. And I changed my rig quite a lot to work for that gig. So and wh was that simply a job? I mean, or uh, did you find any emotion during also that kind of music, which is very distant from what you do usually? Um, it, essentially, it was a job, but I really enjoyed doing it. All I right. think whatever music you play, there's a way to enjoy just trying to do it as well as possible and trying to fit in with the spirit of the music. Yeah and trying to be part of something bigger than just one musician. And certainly as someone who normally does a gig and the front row is all people with binoculars and notepads and filming it on their phone and analysing it, a gig like that where you've got 100,000 people in a field and everyone knows the words to the song and everyone likes the song and they're going crazy, you know, I'm grateful that I got to experience that. Yeah. Uh, which are your major influences uh, as a guitarist and as a composer as well, if um, they are different? Well, I try to be a musician rather than a guitarist. Mm -hmm. I don't care about guitar just for the sake of guitar. Mm -hmm. Guitar is a typewriter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the book that you're writing, it's just the typewriter. Um, but I guess everything... I've ever heard has been an influence. Even the stuff I don't like has influenced me by showing me exactly what I don't want to sound like. Um, but then I guess a few really important things would be all the 50s rock and roll stuff when I was very young. It was pre-army Elvis, I thought was great. Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, all that good stuff. Uh, the Beatles really got me into interesting chord progressions and harmonies at an early age. I guess Eric Clapton, when he was in Cream, that kind of era. Yeah. That's how I learned that a guitar could be like the singer in a band and the guitar could play the melody and it could be the voice. 
Um, Hendrix obviously reinvented the whole instrument in every way imaginable. But the thing I learned about him, well, the thing I learned the most from Hendrix was probably the way he he didn't have rhythm guitar playing and then lead guitar playing yeah. as two separate entities. He was just playing guitar and he would play melodic lines in his rhythm playing and he would play rhythmic stuff in his solo playing. And I remember just listening to that stuff and thinking, this guy is just playing whatever he wants to play. He's completely free. That's cool. Um, in terms of the technical stuff, I guess Ingve Malmsteen, massive influence. Not just because of the speed of it, but when Ingve plays loads of notes, it sounds like he means them. Right. He plays with passion, he plays with sincerity, and a lot of the clones that came out missed that part. They just copied the technique and missed the spirit behind it. But Ingve, whatever other people might say about Ingve, he's a real guitar player. You know. <laughs> so from 2000 to 2006, you've been part of Asia. Is that correct? Roughly, I think I, I started playing with Asia in about '99 right. on an album called Aura. Yeah. They okay. called me in at the last minute as a session player. All right. Just to fill in lots of holes on the yeah. album, <laughs> and I guess they liked what I did because the next thing I knew, I was on a tour bus supporting Paul Rogers. And yeah, and that I carried on being a member of Asia until it all got a bit complicated a few years back when the original members did their reunion yes. tour, which is cool. But it's an awkward situation where you end up with two bands called Asia. Mm. Uh, it was far too confusing. But did you enjoy, was that actually, it started as a job, as, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, yeah. Um, um, was that a cool thing? I mean, a great experience? Do you have good memories about it? Yeah. Mostly because I liked the people in the band. Mm. Uh, that's hugely important if you're going to be trapped on a tiny, smelly tour bus with the same bunch of people 24 hours a day for a whole tour. You know, it's not just about whether they're good players or whether you enjoy the music. So do you get on as human beings? Because if you don't, you need a proper job. Yeah. And fortunately, I thought they were all really nice guys. And certainly that was the first time I'd done any touring on that level, yeah. that kind of yeah. intensity. And yeah, it was a great experience for me. I've, I've seen some very strange parts of the world as a result of doing that, and I made some friends, so it's all good. And what about Dockers Guild, the Mystic Technocracy? I I read that you're involved in that record, and which is uh, brand new. Um, can you I'm tell impressed us that you know about that. <laughs> um, can you tell us more about it? You probably know more about it than I do. Uh, but there's a very, very good keyboard player called Douglas Docker, who I believe lives somewhere near Torino. Um, he's not Italian, or if he is, his English is incredibly good. Mm -hmm. But he, he lives near Torino, and he, I guess he and I have a common friend in Simon Hanhart, the producer who was responsible for mm -hmm. the first Asia album I played on. Mm -hmm. And he needed a guitarist to do lots of guitar parts in a hurry. It's a bit like the Asia story all, all right. over again. The producer <laughs> recommended me. Yeah. Douglas said, uh, OK, do you... Do you think you could play on about four songs? We have this many days. So, okay, I can do that. And I recorded these parts remotely, just at home, with my home set up, and then emailed in the files. And every, every time I finished another song, he would email me back and say, yeah, that sounds great, but uh, there's just one other thing. There's been another problem. Can you do five songs instead of four? Can you do six instead of five? And I think I'm pretty much on the whole album now. All right. And one of the weirdest things about that was when he sent me one of the tracks to play on and I loaded it up into my sequencer and pressed play and thought, hang on, I know that voice. And it was John Payne from Asia. Oh, right. He was a guest vocalist on one of the, the songs. So. But I think people so will was like a big that. Family. <laughs> yeah, it was very incestuous, this whole prog thing. But no, I think people will like the album when it comes out. I haven't heard the finished product yet, but from having worked with rough mixes and stuff yeah. like that. There are some re there's some interesting people playing on it. You've got Goran Edmund singing, you've got Tony Franklin and Greg Bissonette, wow. guys like that, uh, wow. the guy from TNT. You know, it's quite a who's who of that style of music. Um, yeah, but the weird thing about this kind of project is that 
you you never meet with all the other guys. I mean, everybody works at home on his own parts. How does it work? Uh, um, I think you just need one guy to be the mastermind. <laughs> yeah. And just monitor what everyone's doing and check all the files that are coming in. Yeah. So it's like mission control. Right. It's like Houston when they send the <laughs> yes. rocket to the moon. It's all about Houston saying like, yeah, this is what we need to do. And I guess Doug Douglas was that guy. He was controlling the whole project and giving his feedback. And everybody can do their own thing. I mean, you created your own parts or you had any guides or um, any... A bit of both. Mm. I think with anything like that, you have to respect the fact that whoever is paying you and whoever wrote the song has a certain vision of what All that right. music has to sound like. And you have to respect that. And part of doing the job well is trying to guess what they're right. hearing in their head and then make that sound. Yeah. But there were there were other parts where he said, "Well, I've heard you on the Asia album. Just just be just yourself, be yourself and between uh, four minutes and thirty two <laughs> and six minutes oh five. <laughs> Do that Guthrie thing, and then go back to following orders. Yeah. So a mixture of both." Right. Uh, you released a solo album entitled uh, "Erotic Cakes" in two thousand and six. Um, are you working on a new one? Um, um, I mean, solo album. Uh, do you have any schedule on this kind of project, or is it just a matter of inspiration and whenever uh, you're ready, you do it? Well, I've got some stuff tucked away at home right. for that album. Um, I think it would be finished by now, except that I got distracted by another project that excited me even more. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if this is something you were planning to mention later on, but there's a, a cool. new band project <laughs> we're doing called The Aristocrats, okay. um, which happened completely by accident in January mm -hmm. of this year. Um, every January I go to Anaheim in California just to For be the at the NAMM show. show. Yeah, okay. And on this occasion I got an email from Brian Bella, who plays bass with Mike Keneally, He's done a couple of tours with Steve Vai, I think. Basically, I was very well aware of his work, great player. And the email said, Hi Guthrie, you don't know me, I'm Brian Bella. And then needlessly he explained all the things that he, he does. And he said, I have a trio gig I've got to do at the NAMM show with Greg Howe, guitar player, and Marco Minimum, an astonishingly capable drummer. Now, Greg can't do it. Uh, the gig's in about a week. Um, can you learn some songs and help us out? So I jammed with these guys at the NAMM show and I think it was very well received. There was a certain energy at the gig and at the end everyone in the trio had looked around at each other and we were all smiling and said we should do more of this because it just felt right. So for once something in my musical life actually happened quite quickly. We went to a studio in, in Chicago and recorded the whole album in about a week. Uh, three songs each. It's being mixed right now. Uh, hopefully there'll be a finished product within a couple of months. And it's all very exciting, very fun, but it, it distracted me from my solo album, right. and I don't care, because this okay. is something else that interests me. I think that's what you have to do. If you're a, if you're a musician, freelancing like that, you just follow the things that you find interesting, and hopefully right. you attract the kind of crowd who agree and have similar tastes. So a solo album is in the plans, but it we don't know yeah. when. <laughs> okay. It will happen, but I don't feel any pressure to get it finished by a certain day. It will be ready when it's ready, Yeah. and it will be better that way. Um, in 1993, you've been uh, voted, elected guitarist of the year. Um, what that meant to you, and that changed, in a sense, your career? You had a different exposition of, mm. for that? or uh, Honestly, not really. <laughs> I should add, I don't really think of music as a competition. All right. Uh, people would come up to me after that and say, oh, so you're the best guitarist in the UK. It's like, well, I don't think so. You know, Alan Holdsworth didn't enter the competition. Gary Moore didn't enter the competition. <laughs> it's just of the bored kids who could be bothered to enter the competition, I was the one who got lucky. It doesn't mean anything. Um, really, I won just because I, I thought I might make some connections with the, the UK guitar magazines who might be able to get me some work or something like that. I thought it might be nice to win an amp because I, I was a very poor child. Um, and it worked. I got a very nice amp out of winning that competition, but then nothing happened. And I went back to working at McDonald's and oh. so oh, is that it? So about a year later, I wrote to the magazines who had sponsored the competition and said, uh, remember when you, you said I was good at playing guitar? Well, have you got any work for someone who's good at playing guitar? And 
I started a career of transcribing yeah. guitar solos and things for the magazines. How would you define yourself? I mean, more jazz, fusion, blues, or rock guitarist, or a it's bit just, of all of them? Yeah, it's just music. Music, okay. I, so I hate pigeonholing things. <laughs> the only good reason to have to put music in a, into a category is because it can help you to sell it. Um, it help, helps people to, to waste less of their time when they're looking for music that they think they might like. Yeah. So I like the word fusion. All right, because all that means is take all the different stuff you like, put it in a big bowl and cook it all together. Um, unfortunately, fusion has been kind of kidnapped yeah. by a certain kind of soft West Coast, very overproduced type of easy listening. Yeah. So a, a lot of people hear the word fusion and they're turned off, turned off by it. And to me, fusion means what the Mahavishnu Orchestra were doing all those years ago, or what Billy Cobham was doing yeah. in the early 70s. Um, and it's become a cliche, it's become a genre now, and people can copy those blends of influences. But at the time, when those guys first did it, it was something revolutionary yeah. and something very brave. So let's take jazz notes and play them with a rock instrument and then add loads of Indian influence. <laughs> and what are we going to call it? Let's call it fusion. Yeah. So, so the spirit of fusion is a good concept. And the spirit of rock and roll too. I mean, because yeah. um, you, you said yourself that, and uh, uh, you know exactly what to do. You you have a good technique, a great technique, but it's a matter of art for you. So it's also a, like more bluesy and rock and roll in the spirit than uh, is that. I mean, a definition that fits uh, for those who don't know your style. What do you think? Um. I, I guess. I guess it's probably cleverer than normal rock, but it's louder than normal jazz. So somewhere in there. In between. Uh, uh, so maybe it's the worst of both worlds. I don't know. But I think the important thing for me is whatever you're going to play, play it like you mean it. Yeah. Like when we were talking about Ingve, um, and just because someone is very technically capable doesn't mean it should be enough just for them to play things that are difficult to play. Yeah. It's like, I don't care how long you practice that for. Does it sound good? Does it move me? Does yeah. it sound like you mean that? So you mentioned before that you were working in a fast food. Uh, so that sound, you know, the typical dream that you made it because now you're doing what you wanted to do exactly and uh, you're developing and, and building a, a career. Uh, so what would you suggest to somebody that still dreaming about doing this for a living it's a matter just of fortune of dedication passion uh, what is it? a mix of everything or okay it's it's a mix of everything <laughs> I, I finally reached a point where i can fly halfway across the world and when i get to my destination mm -hmm. like nine time zones away someone at the airport will recognize me mm -hmm. which has never been the case before <clears throat> now is that because I started playing when I was three and I was on, I did my first gig when I was five yeah. and I was on national TV in the UK when I was nine or yes. because I won that competition in 93 or because I joined Asia. No, it's none of that. I've tried all these things for decades of my life. That's not why people recognize me. It's because of a few random clips of me jamming along with backing tracks on YouTube. I didn't even put them up there. I didn't tell anyone to watch them. Uh, maybe they're good clips, maybe they're not, but there's a, an, an element of luck there. Yeah. Because there are lots of great clips of people playing guitar really well on YouTube. Uh, some people get lucky, some people don't. I, don't ask me how it works. But in terms of anyone who wants to follow the dream or whatever, yes. say, remember the following music doesn't owe you anything. As soon as you start expecting music to kind of give you a pension or a handout every week, it's like, no. It, Music's just music and it makes you happy, that's enough. It doesn't owe you a living. Yeah. Play music because you have to and you can't help it and you can't imagine a life where you didn't play music. Yeah. And that way you can never be disappointed. Because it's a, it's a weird business. It doesn't make sense. There isn't a, a normal scheme of if you try really hard, you can be promoted and your wage will go up. It kind of doesn't make sense to me as a business model. Um, I don't know if any of that <laughs> adds up to, bit, yeah. to be a complete answer. <laughs> uh, the one other thing I'll share with you, this is not my quote, I think it was Steve Swallow who played bass with Pat Metheny. He mm. said, if you want to be a musician as a career, don't do it. Yeah. 
if you have to be a musician, it's the best job in the world. Yeah. Good one. I wish I'd said that. <laughs> <laughs> you just did, but it's from yeah. somebody else. Yeah. All right. I'm a plagiarist. <laughs> <laughs> Which is your main goal at the moment? Um, just keep doing what I'm doing, really. Um, so you just live day by day and what comes, comes. and. Uh, yeah, I think it's nice to remain a child as much as possible and yeah. to say, if, if something distracts me one day, it's like, oh, that's interesting, I want to do that, I'll do it, yeah. you know, so long as it's something that excites me. So I, th I think I'll, I'll play better in situations that I find challenging and interesting. Yeah. Um, it's a nice goal to try and be part of something that doesn't already exist, yes. which is why even when I mentioned playing with a rapper, playing this pop music, but that, I'm quite proud of being involved with that because this rapper had a 12-piece band with a really good horn section and incredible backing singers. We had, a, for one of the gigs, we had a big string section. We had a 20-person 20 vo wow. male voice choir from some church. Wow. Basically, there were more people on stage than there were in the <laughs> audience. And rappers don't do that. And I thought, cool, this is the first time this kind of gig has ever happened, quite like this. And I'm on stage, I'm a tiny part of it, this feels good. You know, yeah. so it doesn't matter what the style is, but if, if you're making something new or interesting happen, then... Then it's good. That, that's enough of a reason to do <laughs> it. Uh, so, um, just last question. Um, three guitarists that you consider absolute in uh, music history and uh, three guitarists that are completely overrated in your opinion okay i'll start with the e easier one okay th what are three people who are really important in the development of the guitar yes les paul mm -hmm. i hope everyone's familiar with just how incredible les paul was yes he just invented all of the shit that we use now <laughs> and somehow managed to be a chart-topping pop musician at the same time. He was the Da Vinci of guitar, yeah. I think. Um, Hendrix. Uh, I don't need to explain why Hendrix was important. I need one more. It's tempting to say someone like Chet Atkins, and all the rock guys would maybe question that, but hugely important. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the, the rock and roll guitarists, like when rock and roll was a young form of music and they didn't have a huge canon of uh, historical figures to look for. So, what was the previous generation of rock and roll guitarists playing? Well, there wasn't one. Um, a lot of these guys were looking to the more technically accomplished guys like Chet to work out. But look, you look at someone like Jeff Beck. Yeah. I think he got a lot of what he does from players like that. Oh, I... Even though you can't hear <laughs> similarities. And the three overrated. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay, all the others. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. If you can't say something nice about someone, don't say anything at all. All right, good. That's a good point. There's also one thing that I saw on YouTube that you do um, plain riffs uh, of and you know uh, from other guitarists, and uh, you you have the same sound. Is that something that you do always during your clinic or just if somebody oh, asks well? This, this is great. I have a, <laughs> an excuse to apologize for that. Um, I did that for one of the guitar magazines. All right. The background was they had a reader's poll okay. where you had to vote for who you thought was the best guitarist in each of 20 different categories. So you pick... And there were some stupid categories like best strumming <laughs> And everyone just said Pete Townsend because they couldn't think of anyone else who strummed. Uh -huh. There are flamenco guys who would disagree, you know, but <laughs> the public had spoken. So then the magazine said to me, as a regular contributor, you know, it's like, okay, we've got this reader's poll. How do you feel about writing like, a three minute piece of music where you just pastiche everyone who won? And I looked at the list and I said, so you want a piece of music that's got James Taylor and Zach Wilde? You are mad, right? And they said, no, we, we think you can do it. And I thought, actually, I do need the money. I do have to pay some bills this month. OK, I accept your ridiculous challenge. <laughs> and did that thing for the magazine. Okay. And it, it, the audio was on the, the CD that uh -huh. came with the magazine. And I thought, that's the end of it. <laughs> I'm not proud of that. It's not something I would do of my own choice. All right. 
But then the, the curse of YouTube is some kid will find that and go, oh, I'll put that on YouTube. Guthrie Govan shows you how to play in many styles and they don't tell you how it happened or where it came from. Um, it turned into quite a popular clip. Yeah, it is. So. It's a completely pointless piece of music. <laughs> I only did it as part of a job, but I'm glad people enjoy it. Okay, so last thing, let's show here your child, your signature model, and if you want to present it or uh, yeah, tell okay. something about it. So, promotion time. <laughs> so, there we go. Oh, this, this is my lovely guitar. And now it has frets. Okay, I'll tell you about this. Um, if you're not a guitar player, just do put on the kettle or something, make some coffee. <laughs> this will get better in a minute. But um, this is a special one. It's got basswood body, plain maple top, uh, roasted maple neck. Now this is what happens when you take a piece of maple and put it in an oven with no oxygen and then burn it. Um, it's darker than normal maple because all the moisture and all the dirt and the impurities have all been kind of baked out of the wood and it makes it ring differently, it makes it very resonant and it makes it more stable which is good for me because I might be in St. Petersburg one day and then be in Caracas the next day and it's a completely different temperature, different moisture in the air. Most guitar necks will move a lot and this stuff doesn't move so much. It's very dependable. Uh, stainless steel frets, which are great because they last for a very long time. Non-locking whammy bar. There's a thing at the back which I, it's called a tremel now and I can tighten these things to stop the whammy bar from moving. And that's, that's great for certain tuning adjustments. Um, what else can I tell you? Oh yeah, and special lacquer. I've discovered that I think this lacquer sounds better than modern lacquer. This is nitrocellulose, it's what they used in the 50s. Now, this guitar was made in California, and spraying nitrocellulose lacquer in California is illegal because it's not good for the ozone layer. So what they do, they build the guitar and then they send it to a guy who doesn't live in California. He's in Oregon or somewhere like that. The guy sprays it with poison lacquer and then mails it back to California, and that way it's legal. But this stuff just ages differently. This, this is not an old guitar, but already it's going like a Stevie Ray Strat. It's getting good looking injuries. And the resonance is just slightly nicer, I think. So there you go, that's my signature guitar. And I can prove it. Look, that's my name. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Kathy. It's been a pleasure. Uh, it's been a pleasure for us, and uh, we hope we will have you back at Linear Rock soon. Oh, thank you. <laughs>